Good afternoon. My name is Brian Schreiner. I'm the Dean of Florida International University College of Communication, Architecture and the Arts here in Miami, Florida. I wanna welcome you to the role of the media in contemporary society, a conversation with Mr. Simon Marks. Uh, these conversations are presented by our FIU School of Communication and Journalism, along with the FIU Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs here at FIU. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Marks. Mr. Marks is the President and Chief Correspondent of Feature Story News, FSN. Mr. Marks created the company in 1992. Today it operates in more than 30 news bureaus worldwide. Mr. Marks is passionate about serious, engaging coverage of the most important news stories of our time. His work building and developing FSN has been driven by determination to help keep the global news agenda alive and ensure that in-depth international coverage is available to both the largest network and the smallest station alike. Mr. Marks travels the world on a continuing basis for the most respected news outlets on the air and has interviewed many of the world's leading newsmakers, including presidents and prime ministers. It's now my pleasure to welcome you and uh, to introduce to you uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. John Stack, the founding dean of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Dr. Stack. Thank you, Brian. I'm thrilled to partner once again with Dean Schreiner and the School of Communications. This has been an important series spotlighting the role of the media in contemporary society. It has not been an easy time of late, both in terms of covering the news and in terms of staying in business. The Pew Research Center recently issued a report that found newsroom employees in the United States had dropped by 26% since 2008. Another report, this one by the Knight Foundation and the University of North Carolina found that since 2004, the United States has lost one fourth, 2100 of its newspapers. This includes 70 dailies and more than 2000 weeklies or non-dailies. A recent survey put the put out by Reuters for, uh, for the study of journalism at Oxford uh, of 40 countries ranked the United States last in media trust at 29%. It attributed some of this distrust to our, to our heightened political polarization, which has not subsided. At the same time, another Pew Research Center survey conducted in 2018 found that, quote, most Americans think their local news media are doing just fine financially, end of quote. Meanwhile, the threats to journalists and news organizations around the world are increasing, including here in this country. The job of being a reporter, in other words, is getting more difficult with fewer employment opportunities to boot. There are many fine reporters out there working at small, medium and large media organizations. One of them is here with us today. I love listening to Simon Marks' American Week for Eddie Mayer's program on the UK's LBC. He brings great insights into developments here, and that accent doesn't hurt one bit. Simon joined us for the last State of the World Conference, and we hope he will become a regular here at FIU. I first met him down here in Miami at a wedding for a mutual friend of ours almost two years ago. That was a great wedding, by the way. I am delighted he's joining us for our first media series and for that, let me turn it over to that mutual friend of ours, my colleague uh, at the Green School and senior fellow, David Kramer. Dean Stack, thanks so much, Dean Schreiner. It's always a pleasure to partner with you and the School of Communications. 
And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome and introduce uh, Simon Marks, who's an old friend of mine. And uh, we met indirectly uh, about 30 years ago, in fact. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, but Simon, let me, let me give you an opportunity to share with our viewers um, what is FSN um, and, and how did you come about in, in starting it? Uh, thanks, David. It's great to see you. And thanks to uh, Dean Schreiner and Dr. Stack for those very generous uh, introductions. I, I love doing uh, things with FIU, so uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this today. Um, Feature Story News uh, is um, an independent broadcast news agency, which means that we are essentially a business that provides uh, a whole array of broadcasters uh, with news content, both packaged, prepackaged reports and an enormous number of live reports on a daily basis. Uh, we started 29 years ago. I'm just realizing that next year is our 30th anniversary. Um, and uh, initially, uh, I mean, it's a, a long, tedious story, obviously over three decades, but I was working in Moscow uh, at the time for the Christian Science Monitors television operation, uh, which uh, after a couple of years ceased to exist. And so I was essentially laid off. Um, along with hundreds of other people. And uh, Moscow was a fascinating place to be at the time because Boris Yeltsin had just taken over and the Soviet Union had come to an end. So I decided I wanted to stay there uh, and essentially created the, the corporate vehicle simply as a bank account uh, to process payments for freelance work that I was proposing to do for various uh, international broadcasters. Fast forward and what has been obviously a very long and complicated journey and 30 years later, we now have 35 offices around the world. We've got a full time team uh, of about 100 staff and, it, and these are bricks and mortar offices with full time salaried benefited staff. Uh, we have 10 bureaus, for example, in Africa. Uh, we still have the old uh, Moscow bureau, new office, but the same the same bureau in uh, uh, in Moscow. That's never gone away. Uh, we, we're headquartered now here in Washington, D.C., with bureaus in New York at the United Nations. Los Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, uh, Mexico City, Caracas. We've got the only uh, live TV studio in downtown Caracas, which is uh, obviously a fascinating place to be. And what we're providing is niche customized content to all of these different broadcasters. We're not a one size fits all video news agency. If you're a broadcaster and you want a specific story, uh, or you want um, to expand your global reach, you use our reporters. So uh, uh, John was kind enough to mention the piece that I do once a week for LBC. I've just done today's uh, American Week. To the listeners of LBC, I am LBC's Washington correspondent. Unless they follow me on social media, they don't necessarily know that I'm also to the viewers of Channel News Asia in Singapore, Channel News Asia's US bureau chief, or to the viewers of uh, ENCA, which is an all news channel in South Africa uh, that I'll be doing a live for in about an hour and a half, uh, ENCA's Washington correspondent. So these are all sort of niche driven, customized reports uh, that look at the world um, through a variety of different prisms, because each broadcaster, of course, has its own uh, agenda. If you're a South African national broadcaster, the stories that you're interested in and the angles that you're interested in are completely different than if you're an American broadcaster or a British one. So I hope that's a, a, a long answer to a, to, to a short question. Sure. Yeah. How many staff again, did you say? About 100. About 100. About 100. That's pretty amazing, because uh, I remember the early days. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and speaking of early days, let, let's just take a minute uh, to talk about that. Um, we, as I said at the outset, you and I met indirectly. You were in Moscow covering uh, the whole story there, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I was actually in Boston um, doing analysis for this very same network that you were reporting for the Christian Science Monitor Television Network. And uh, just, just give us, uh, elaborate a little more, give us a little more sense of what it was like to be in Moscow at that time. And that was, that was a wild time to say the least with uh, a lot of things happening. Absolutely wild time. And I don't think if I'm honest about it, David, that I fully appreciated it because at the time I was, I mean, I'm a young man, as you can tell, I'm, I, I, was, I was in my twenties at the time. 
And so uh, I had arrived, I'd been in and out of Moscow a bit and had covered the various revolutions in Eastern Europe uh, for the Christian Science Monitor, including the Velvet Revolution in uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Romania, Hungary, um, but we had not established a full-time Moscow office. And at a certain point, it became absolutely necessary that we did. And they asked me to go out and, uh, and start it. Um, I sort of arrived there on a full-time basis uh, four months before the coup against, uh, the attempted coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. So I basically just got unpacked. Um, I was sort of still learning my way around the subway system and suddenly um, everything changed. We did when the attempted coup happened, I think we were on the air for uh, 18 days straight doing long, you know, six, eight minute pieces. Uh, for World Monitor, which was the Christian Science Monitor's uh, nightly news program, which aired on the Discovery Channel. Um, I sort of remember clambering on board the back of a Red Army tank the day the coup collapsed uh, with all of these cheering youngsters who were thrilled and delighted that the coup had been overthrown. And I thought, oh, this is this is this is fun, you know. But you don't realize in your in your mid twenties that this is going to be the story in many ways of your lifetime. Um, it was tough to live there. Uh, you know, there weren't that many places to go and eat. L leisure time was, uh, you know, you had to be very inventive about the way in which you spent it. Um, I, there were moments when I'm pretty certain I was, in fact, I'm 100% certain my phone was tapped and at various points in the dying, you know, the dying months of the, uh, the Soviet era, um, you know, I think attempts were made to find out more about me than I necessarily wanted the authorities to know. Uh, I went back to London on a pretty regular basis. And then with colleagues, we would uh, we'd sort of disappear from Moscow to Estonia, uh, to Tallinn at weekends, which at the time had the only Indian restaurant for 12 time zones. Uh, so that was a welcome break. But in terms of in terms of a journalistic proving ground, it was an absolutely amazing story to be able to tell. And I was lucky because I'd studied uh, Russian and Soviet history and politics uh, at university with, with uh, two great teachers, uh, Peter Redaway and Dominic Levin. Um, and that gave me, I think, the background to be able to, to, to get in there and, uh, and survive and cover the story. And, uh, you know, it was, it was astonishing, really. Do you still have a presence there in Moscow? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we have a big bureau in Moscow. We've got, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a substantial uh, piece of property. It overlooks the Russian White House. If you've ever seen a mm -hmm. live report on CNN, we're like two windows away from it. Um, and we've got six or seven people in Moscow at this point and, and a busy operation. And how has it changed in terms of uh, government pressure? Because uh, if you look at something like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty has come under tremendous attack from the Russian government with fines into the millions of dollars. And I think it's just a matter of time before it's forced out. But um, have you, uh, has FSN experienced any pressure uh, to change the stories or to even shut down and get out? Well, we've experienced no pressure to change stories at all. Um, uh, you know, we've been there a long time, so yeah. we have a track record now over 30 years. We are officially an American news organization. Um, you know, we are a U.S. company, even though I'm not an American citizen and and uh, and the company, you know, is is rooted, if you like, in, in the U.K., but officially we're a U.S. corporation. Um, and so that leaves us potentially exposed. Um, there are moments of uncertainty when visa applications may take a long time to process. We've just been through one of those. And you're never quite sure what that's about. Could just be the bureaucracy moving slower, could be more than that. I mean, I think there's a couple of distinctions between us, for example, and RFERL. We're not broadcasting to Russia or yeah. to or or or. Uh, addressing a domestic audience. We're absolutely covering events in Russia for all of these different major international channels. Um, they know us. I mean, I've done interviews with Sergei Lavrov myself. Uh, we have facilitated interviews for broadcasters with Vladimir Putin. I interviewed Vladimir Putin very, very early on in his, uh, in his tenure. So they know who we are. 
Um, and, you know, while some American news organizations have undoubtedly had uh, difficulties and issues, we have thus far not been one of them. Let me let me go to almost the opposite end of the earth, uh, and that's South Africa, where you have spent a lot of time. And I'm curious about uh, if you share your experiences uh, reporting from there and then what you think of what's been happening there uh, more recently, which is really sad to see. Yeah, it's devastating. I mean, I, I have a, a tremendous personal tie to South Africa because my mother was South African, came from Johannesburg, right. although left when she was a, a young woman and didn't go back for 40 years to visit. Um, uh, and, and sort of rather oddly, she grew up hoping to become an announcer for the SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, until she became politically conscious and realized that that wasn't going to, in the middle of the apartheid era, work for her. Uh, and in fact, for many years, I was the SABC's Washington correspondent through FSN. Uh, we now work for both the SABC and for ENCA, its commercial competitor. I do quite a lot of work for various South African radio stations as well, including 702, which is the big talk station in South Africa. And I've been lucky enough to go there on numerous occasions. We were actually hired uh, because of our relationship with um, uh, ENCA, the commercial news channel. We were brought in as consultants to help overhaul and refresh uh, the channel's output just a couple of years ago. And I ended up spending months, uh, you know, cumulatively uh, in Johannesburg and Cape Town um, you know, the, the, the last few weeks, uh, and anyone in South Africa will tell you this, have obviously been extremely challenging, with Jacob Zuma now jailed, using the opportunity of his jailing to rally support in his name, with uh, the economic freedom fighters, the sort of left-leaning young, young radical uh, political party, uh, seeking to uh, exploit what's taken place over the last few weeks. And I think for many South Africans, uh, this is a moment when they're wondering exactly where is this country heading and is President Ramaphosa up to the business of calming things down? You may have seen the New York Times uh, op-ed a few days ago saying South Africa is falling apart at the seams. I mean, I think that's probably slightly overstating it at the moment, but there is no question that there are great anxieties and COVID and the, uh, the vaccine rollout and the difficulties that South Africa has had, first of all, in sourcing vaccines, and then frankly, self-imposed difficulties in deciding which vaccines to use uh, has only added to this absolutely steaming cauldron. So I think it's very concerning. From all the bureaus and offices you have, what's the most challenging one to report from? I mean, you mentioned Caracas. I would imagine it's yeah, not Caracas, easy reporting actually, it's from there. It's interesting you say that because you, you'd think Caracas must be enormously complicated. And for a while, we had a bureau in Havana as well. And actually, you know, in, in some ways, they're, they're, the rules are clear um, and you don't often hit trip wires. I mean, you will get more in Havana. I don't think it's ever happened to us in Venezuela, but in Havana, you'll occasionally get approached and asked why exactly you covered the story the way you did it. I would say the most complicated environment in which we currently operate is Beijing. Um, uh, you, you know, we are again listed in China as an American news organization. In the interests of full disclosure, we also have a business, uh, one of our clients is CGTN, the China Global Television Network, which is the English language uh, Chinese funded state broadcaster. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's trying to be China's version of CNN International or Al Jazeera, uh, and in very large measure succeeding in that endeavor. Uh, so again, we're in this kind of slightly odd position where we're not telling Beijing's story and China's story for Chinese audiences, we're telling it for an international audience. And in many parts of the world, our reporters are appearing on CGTN. Uh, but, you know, there's absolutely no question that from both ends of the telescope, uh, you know, that, 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 that is under current circumstances where you have um, a, a, a chill in the relationship between Washington and Beijing, uh, that has the potential to create complexities. So you um, produce reports um, for both American and foreign audiences. In preparing these stories, is there a significant difference in how you approach a story? I imagine it varies from 
story to story, of course, but um, is, is there a particular style or approach that you take for an American audience versus a, a foreign one? So we're absolutely guided by the style and tonality of each broadcaster, whether it's, a, whether it's American, Canadian, we do a lot of work for CBC now, Australian, uh, New Zealand, we do an enormous amount of work for Radio New Zealand, LBC in the UK, ITV in the UK, Channel 4 in the UK, CGTN, Channel News Asia in Singapore, all of these broadcasters have their own on-air tone. I mean, if you listen to NPR, you're hearing a very different style and tone than if you're listening to CBS News Radio. Um, if you're watching the PBS News Hour, you're hearing a very, very different style and tone than you're seeing if you're watching CNN. So our mission is to make sure that every single broadcaster that we serve, when we appear on their air and when we provide them with material, the viewer doesn't scratch their head and say, oh, what was that? That stuck out like a sore thumb. That's a very, who, who are those people? We're absolutely, as the former executive producer of the News Hour put it, woven into the tapestry of her newsroom. So we are not, um, we are not, unless the network wishes to, we're not identified as being freelancers or coming from a broadcast news agency. We are the News Hour's special correspondent. Um, uh, LBC's Washington's bureau chief. So the, the, the difference comes in the way in which you write the report for all of those different audiences. I know viscerally who I'm supposed to be when I'm an on-air, for want of a word I hate, when I'm an on-air personality, when I'm an on-air reporter at LBC, I know that that persona is slightly different than the person who shows up uh, on you know, PBS or, or Channel News Asia. But that's driven much more by the style of each broadcaster rather than simply saying, there's a distinction between American television and the rest of the world. So let's, uh, let, let me just mention to our, our, our viewers, you can send in any uh, questions or comments through the Q&A function, if you would. Um, but I, I've got some more, so let me, let me continue. And let, let's stay, step back for a, a minute and, and let me ask you to compare and contrast covering the Trump administration with covering the current Biden administration. Well, we get some rest. Um, I mean, you know, the, 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 the obvious distinction is that literally reporters in this town like me are not waking up at three o'clock in the morning to check their cell phones to see what he's tweeted. I don't have to worry that when I leave the house in the morning, I mean, I'm actually working from home because of the pandemic, but in the old days when I left the house in the morning, I'd be halfway to work thinking that I knew exactly what story I'd be covering that day. And then I glance at my phone and see another tweet storm and realize that we were uh, potentially being led in a different direction. And we were much too easily led on far too many occasions by uh, that errant Twitter account. Um, you know, there, there was a tendency, I think, to expect that international interest would wane when Donald Trump disappeared. And there's no question that Donald Trump was fabulous for the bottom line of organizations like mine. I could, during the Trump era, be on air somewhere anytime I wanted. I could, anytime, 24 hours a day, I could be on the air somewhere. Um, that has slightly dissipated, but I do think that there is an enormous ongoing interest in where this country is heading. And in many ways, I think we're still, uh, you know, unresolved in terms of answering that question. Uh, I very much view myself now, you know, the big story I think I'll be covering for the rest of my career is, is the president of the United States correct that liberal democracies like America can unite and can succeed in vanquishing the threat from autocracies. Um, is the president of the United States correct when he says that his predecessor was an aberration, was an asterisk in history? Uh, and that, you know, we'll all, we're, we're putting the country back on the trajectory to normalcy. I don't think we know the answers to those questions yet. And so I, I think there is still tremendous uh, international interest in, in in pursuing that story. And that's what I personally do every day. I should have explained earlier that I split my time between managing the company and being on air. And and, and the principal thing I do here is, is act as, uh, as our chief Washington correspondent. 
So let me, there's always criticism of the media. Um, there was criticism of the media during the Trump administration that led, in fact, from the president himself to accuse the media of being enemies of the, of the state and uh, fake news. Um, but there's criticism of the media now, not so much coming from the White House these days, but from supporters of the previous administration saying the media is covering Biden administration with kid gloves. How, how do you how do you think that criticism holds up? Well, the first difficulty with that argument is, first of all, there is no singular the media. I mean, and there hasn't been for a good long while. Yeah. Um, I uh, I was just I was just on holiday for a week, and I was rereading some of Alastair Cook's newspaper dispatches. For those who don't know, Alastair Cook was a veteran British correspondent here from the fifties onwards, forties onwards and uh, had his own weekly uh, broadcast on the BBC called Letter from America. And I was rereading his dispatch about um, the uh, Murrow broadcast on the McCarthy hearings uh, that obviously completely changed the course of American history at the time. And you realize that the distinction between what was happening then and what's happening now is that Edward R. Murrow had, he, he had the national audience and the capacity to move the center Whereas here, we're all now in so many different niches and in so many different echo chambers and silos that you can't imagine that there is any single person that any longer in the media uh, could move the national conversation like that. Um, I, I think that uh, there is no question that the Washington Press Corps was so battered and bruised and abused and, and I mean abused by the Trump administration. It, it was a, a gross abuse uh, of all the norms of the White House to allow uh, personalities from propaganda broadcast channels to even be in the White House briefing room in direct contravention uh, of agreements with the White House Correspondents Association, just disgraceful. Um, that I think there has been uh, from day one of the Biden administration, this, this tendency among many to say, oh, thank God that's over, back to normalcy, back to at least some semblance of fact-based presentation behind the White House podium. But there is a danger in that, which is that you become, um, uh, you're, you're no longer open to examining what is ac exact actually going on here. I mean, as, as, as David knows, I've, I've personally become somewhat obsessed by uh, the ongoing claim that this administration has made like a mantra that 99.5% of COVID-19 deaths and 97%, as they used to tell it, now they say 95%, of COVID-19 hospitalizations are among the un unvaccinated. It is, as the president said again today, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. If you explore those numbers, they don't hold up. And now the head of the CDC acknowledges those numbers were gathered from a study that was conducted before the Delta variant came along, uh, that it was a limited survey carried out in only five or six states. Public Health England today produced statistics showing that 35% of hospitalizations in England are among the fully vaccinated. So uh, I noticed that this week, uh, CNN, Caitlin Collins, who's a terrific reporter, started challenging those numbers. Um, and we should have been challenging them, I think, earlier than that, because it was apparent three or four weeks ago, I think, that those numbers were unreliable. And, you know, you've just as important as it was to point out when the last administration was um, not embracing facts, I think it's important to do the same thing now. The fake news moniker uh, has done damage not just to the United States, but to the rest of the world. I see this week that the Ethiopian government has been saying that reports of hundreds of bodies washing up on a riverbank between Tigray and Sudan are fake news. This, this uh, buzz phrase has unfortunately gone around the world now. How about coverage of the pandemic? Um, how, how would you assess it both? Uh, let, let's go back to the beginning of it, last year to the present. Um, have there been changes in the way that, that it's been covered and uh, the way 
each administration has, has approached it in terms of the coverage of that too? Well, I think, uh, I mean, yes, because we, we now, I mean, uh, the, obviously covering those those press conferences where Donald Trump was flanked by doctors Burks and Fauci and uh, you know suddenly we were talking about hydroxychloroquine or maybe disinfectant could work I mean that was just like madness and mayhem um, I, I think that one of the difficulties that that all of us have largely faced is that the vast majority of us working in the media and covering these events on a daily basis have no medical background whatsoever uh, and so the first thing we've all had to do is figure out who are the trusted sources. And that's often very difficult to determine and identify because within the medical community, uh, there are obviously disagreements and disputes about uh, precisely which way uh, the response to the pandemic ought to be moving and shifting. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as the story developed, uh, and we realized, for example, that the former president of the United States knew months before he publicly disclosed it uh, that COVID-19 was uh, spreading through the air. Uh, you know, should he should there have been more of a of a bid to try and nail that detail down, the important details relating uh, to the virus itself? Yes, probably. Um, but again, lots of people that you're watching on television are not medical experts or reading in the papers. And some of the people that you're reading in the papers who are not medical experts have decided that they are nonetheless now sufficiently aware of what's going on that they should be dispensing medical advice, which I always find, uh, you know, very peculiar. I, I do think that it is astonishing that we went through an election campaign in the middle of a global pandemic. And at no point was either of the candidates for the nation's highest office asked what their plan was to prepare the country for the next one. That to me, I mean, to watch debate after debate after debate and appearance after appearance, interview after interview, and simply never to see that question asked was amazing. Let me ask you about um, a tendency in journalism that is not new, um, but that has been around for a long time. But let me ask you if it is now out of date. And that is this desire and effort by journalists to provide quote unquote balance or to present both sides of a story. What, what does that mean in these terribly polarizing times that we live in now? Well, it means that we're all facing a challenge. And I mean, I've lived through this myself in the last year, you know, a year ago, I was regularly being accused of being a paid uh, supporter of the Democratic National Committee by various viewers and listeners all over the world because of some of the reporting that I would present on the Trump administration. And now I would argue that my reporting of the Biden administration is just as vigorous as my reporting was on the Trump administration. And that conversation has gone rather cold. Um, you know, balance is complicated. What is balance now in terms of coverage of climate change? Does balance on the climate change issue mean that you give equal time to climate change skeptics that you provide to climate change experts? I don't think it, it requires that anymore, uh, but you absolutely can question the conclusions uh, that the climate change uh, experts and the scientists and the studies produce. Um, so balance does not necessarily, does not necessarily require you um, to uh, offer equal time to the people who were clearly uh, attempting, I think, to launch an attempted coup here in January uh, by mounting an insurrection on Capitol Hill, uh, as you devote to those people who question their motives for doing it. However, objectivity does require you to explain who those people were and how many of them are out there and how big a uh, grouping they are in terms of America's polarized politics. And I do think that certainly in 2016, and to some extent, even in 2020, the media did not fully understand, definitely in 2016, we had no idea of the extent uh, of the uh, readiness of Donald Trump, for example, to bring people who had never been in the political mainstream in America into the political mainstream in America. So, uh, 
you know, balance, objectivity, impartiality, these are all very, very complicated journalistic concepts. But at the end of the day, it's not, I don't believe it is my job to tell people what to think. I think it's my job still to prevent, to present them with the raw information that they need in order then to go off and make their own conclusions as responsible uh, members of a, of a democratized um, nation state. Uh, so I'm not really in the business of telling them what to think. I'm much more in the business of providing them with raw information, but doing so in a manner that uh, doesn't mislead them by saying, well, this, this climate change skeptic over here has an opinion that is just as valuable as the opinion of David Attenborough over here. So uh, in, in just a little bit time that we have left, um, let me turn and ask you uh, to talk about our, our students. Um, and um, one, one question is, what advice would you have for students who are studying journalism, who aspire to be journalists? And then what skill sets uh, must they develop to become good journalists? Well, it's still the best job in the world. I mean, I still go to bed at night thinking, my God, these people pay me to do this. Um, Peter Jennings once described being a, uh, an in the field reporter as the, you know, the greatest education, the greatest paid education you could get. And he meant they were paying him to give him the, to give him the education. Um, I, I think that it is absolutely critical today, constantly to be across the latest technological developments. Um, you need now to be able to do everything. The debate about whether reporters ought to be able to film their own material, edit their own material. I mean, I, I, I'm operating from a completely self-opt facility here. I'm actually in my garage, which doubles as a TV studio and a radio studio. I run my own teleprompter when I need to use one. I uh, get my own live signals up and distributed. You have to be absolutely across all the technology. But most importantly, you've got to be across the story that you want to cover. You can't, you know, so you have to read and you have all the time uh, and you have to decide what sources you trust and what uh, journalistic um, enterprises you admire, uh, and you have to salt information away like a like a hamster, uh, you know, gathering nuts before the winter, like a squirrel uh, gathering acorns before the winter, because you never know when information about various things is going to be uh, helpful in terms of the coverage that you're you're providing. Um, so I think in all of those regards, uh, it's a it's an amazing privilege to do this work every day. You have to understand it's an amazing privilege, but it's a position that comes with responsibility. And um, if you're ready for all of that, it's, uh, it's an amazing life. Well, it certainly has been for you, my friend. So, uh, <laughs> and this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm uh, tremendously grateful Simon, uh, out of a very busy schedule and just back actually from a week off, much needed, I know, uh, for you and your family um, that you joined us here today. So uh, let me thank you very, very much for, for joining us here. This is gonna be very useful for our journalism students in the coming semesters. So uh, a really rich discussion, very, very grateful. So thank you, my friend. Thanks, David, greatly appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. You bet. So this has been the latest in the series, uh, the role of the media in contemporary uh, society. And it's a partnership between the FIU School of Communications and the Green School of International and Public Affairs. I'm David Kramer. Thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time.